Okay, um, I'd like to welcome uh, Michael Cordover, who I invited to speak here. He's a, a lawyer from Tasmania who has what I think is a particularly interesting and important story to tell about uh, openness in government and how we get our government. So, um, and also for that excellent recitation of Pi, please <laughs> give him a warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very kind. Uh, so, uh, my name is Michael Cordova. Uh, it's my Twitter handle and everything else. Um, I'm a lawyer, uh, just like this guy from 1876. Uh, I speak here in my personal capacity. Um, this is not legal advice. Some of the stuff will be abbreviated and uh, made s simpler or, or a little bit different. Uh, I'm not your lawyer, but I could be. Uh, <laughs> I... Uh, uh, I had a little joke planned about uh, how I'm also a sysadmin because I run one Amazon EC2 micro instance, so that, um, thank you. Uh, uh, I dabbled in web application development for a long time, uh, but don't really do any of that these days. Uh, I run Arch Linux, hence the trouble that we had earlier. Uh, <laughs> at least it's not Gen 2. Um, so, uh, open government, we've talked a bit about it at this conference already. Uh, there's a lot of really great stuff going on in this sphere. We've got open data, we've got the release of information through Creative Commons licenses, uh, we've got things like the open government partnership that people have been talking about, uh, we've got some great work going on in terms of uh, hack days and, and the fact that government is now releasing a lot more information than they used to. Uh, this talk isn't really about any of that stuff. This is about uh, when government doesn't release information that you really want it to. Uh, so in honour of one of my uh, uh, crowdfunding backers who uh, paid in Bitcoin and went by the name of Gordon Freeman, uh, I've got a crowbar there, which really is what this is about. It's about forcing government to be open when government doesn't want to be open, and, and uh, my experience in trying to do that. Uh, so it all starts with a tweet. Uh, Asher Wolf, who some of you uh, will know or know of, uh, tweeted about uh, the computerised Senate scrutiny that went on in the 2013 election in Australia. Um, for me, this uh, really had callbacks to issues that happened in 2000 in the United States. Uh, some of you might recall issues with Diebold voting machines uh, being closed source and potentially uh, being manipulated or able to be manipulated. Um, so, we'll just keep going. Uh, so, I mean, this really, to me, was a really interesting question about how is it that these uh, the computerized scrutiny operates? Uh, what is the process by which that happens? Um, the other thing, uh, okay. So paper is sometimes a really good way of counting votes, um, and thank you to the Electoral Commission of Australia, uh, which provided this photo under Creative Commons licensing. Um, the paper is a great way of, of uh, dealing with votes because it's secure, it's essentially impossible to hack, it's really easy to monitor to make sure that uh, the numbers going in are the same as the numbers going out, that sort of thing. The trouble is that ballot papers in uh, for the Senate vote are really complex. Uh, this is a photo of the famous 2013 ballot paper, uh, which was more than a metre long. Uh, we're talking about hundreds of candidates, uh, transferable votes, hundreds or thousands of rounds of counting, uh, where the votes get transferred by eliminating one candidate and redistributing their votes to others. Uh, so that's basically impossible to do uh, by hand. It's essentially impossible to do on paper. So uh, what the, the system that we have and the system that has been in place since uh, the Electoral Act changed in 1987 is based on inputting all of this information into a computer and then the computer runs through all those calculations and spits out a result. Uh, it also does so in fixed point precision, despite the fact that there's nothing in the Electoral Act specifying fixed point precision. Um, which has some really interesting consequences in terms of the tiny fractions of votes that you end up with, um, and they actually get lost by uh, they get lost by fraction. Um, anyway, so I thought it would be really interesting to see uh, exactly what it is that is running 
the uh, vote counting system. I, I think it's a relatively straightforward piece of code, uh, but it does have some room for error. In particular, uh, you're talking about a lot of fractions with very large denominators, very small numerators, uh, especially in early counts. Uh, so there's a lot of room for error if they're using IEEE floating points, God forbid. Um, but <laughs> I'm Jewish. It's, anyway. uh, so, so uh, the, uh, the, uh, I, I thought that this would be something where there's a lot of room for error, but it's relatively simple code. So it should be easy to access. Uh, and I happen to know that uh, the definition of document in the Freedom of Information Act is really, really broad. It's extracted there, but essentially it's that regex. It's basically anything that exists. Um, if there's information in it, it's going to be a document for the purposes of the Freedom of Information Act. So I thought this will be pretty straightforward. Put in a Freedom of Information request, get out the particular uh, uh, class or code that is being used to uh, run the Senate counting of votes. Um, I should add that I'm not the first person to use freedom of information in this way. Uh, there are some other people, both in Australia and overseas, who have done some great work using freedom of information to force the release of government information. Uh, Dr. Mark Diamond uh, is a social science researcher uh, who used freedom of information to try to access uh, the database underlying the MySchool website um, and was ultimately unsuccessful in that uh, because of some weird exceptions, but he did a lot of work in that area. Uh, Mark Newton famously tried to get the source code for the cybersecurity help button that some of you may recall. Uh, it turns out that the government didn't get the source code because why would you get that from a contractor? Uh, so like, I'm not the first person to do this, but uh, it, it seems like I'm the first person to, uh, to really push for uh, software, and in particular voting software, out of the government. So uh, if those of you who were in Chris's talk earlier will be aware of the request response cycle. Uh, <laughs> there was indeed a request response cycle that we had on the 4th of October 2013. That's more than two years ago now. Uh, I asked for a copy of the code and I got told no. Uh, I asked for an internal review. Uh, I got told no again um, in literally the same words. They'd clearly done the copying and pasting. Uh, the Electoral Commission said that they'd identified 58 documents that uh, included the source code that was used to count the uh, Senate election, and I asked for other things like data specs and, and that sort of thing. Uh, but they weren't w willing even to provide me with a list of those documents that comprised the uh, source code. And the reason that they said no was that there was commercial in confidence information contained in this software. Um, that shocked me, as I'm, I seem to shock a lot of other people as well. And it turns out that what happens is the Electoral Commission uh, runs elections not just for federal parliament, uh, but also sometimes for other government entities, state parliaments. Sometimes they run elections for unions or large organisations like NRMA or big clubs. Um, and in running those elections, they charge a fee for that service uh, and they use the same software that they used to count Senate votes to count votes in those elections. So essentially what they said was uh, that they would lose some commercial value associated with those fee-for-service elections if I was permitted to see the source code that was being used to count votes. Um, but uh, I mean, so, so that was their underlying reason, and they said that even providing me with a list of documents, which I initially assumed was a list of files, but it turns out isn't, that isn't the case either, uh, they said providing that list of documents would reveal some confidential information would cause them to lose uh, commercial value, uh, which is dumbfounding to anyone who knows anything about software development. Right? The uh, software that we're talking about is relatively straightforward. It's not like uh, it's some great new algorithm for adding numbers. Uh, it's, it's, it's really pretty simple. Uh, there are certainly a whole range of functions associated with that, and the software does things like uh, managing the input of data for who the candidates are, managing group voting tickets, but this stuff is not complex. And in fact, there is a Western Australian software developer who, uh, after the controversy in early 2014 and rerunning the West Australian 
uh, election, wrote it in, uh, in Python and JavaScript, and took him a weekend. So it's, it's not particularly hard to recreate this system, uh, and this idea that there was some, uh, some commerciality to it was really surprising to me, and hence why I kept pushing. The other thing that uh, was surprising to me was just how resistant the Electoral Commission was to being uh, helpful at all. Uh, everything that they provided to me was uh, a Word document that had been printed and then scanned back in as a PDF, uh, yeah, as an image that was then embedded in a PDF, that's right. So no OCR, I couldn't copy and paste things. Uh, you know, I had this 30-page uh, rejection refusal letter uh, that I wanted to appeal against and I wanted to quote elements out of, uh, and I couldn't copy and paste it. I had to retype the bits that I wanted. So I actually asked, I said, hey, could I uh, actually have a copy of this in Word format, you know, without the signature, without any bits that you think are confidential, just so I can copy and paste that information? And they said, well, actually, we've given you the PDF and that completes the AEC's obligations under the Freedom of Information Act. Um, I uh, was willing to leave it there, but uh, Matt Landauer, who's uh, part of the Open Australia Foundation and runs the Right to Know website, uh, which is uh, the website through which I made my initial request, uh, he got angry about it, as is probably fair, uh, and put in another request uh, for the Word version of uh, <laughs> the, the letter that I was requesting. Uh, they purported to accept that request and provided him again with a scanned copy of the PDF. Um, so, uh, and that becomes uh, important a little bit later on because uh, they started to get upset with me. Uh, what I uh, ended up doing is I, I was going to take a review through uh, what's known as the Office of the Australian Information Commissioner. Um, that office was being disbanded at the time that I needed them to review this decision. Um, it's still uh, un completely unfunded, so it was a budget announcement in 2014 that uh, the office would no longer be funded as of the end of 2014. Uh, the legislation to re remove the office has not passed the Senate, uh, but there is no budgetary allocation for it. So the Information Commissioner uh, has been working out of his house, uh, doing freedom of information reviews uh, and developing freedom of information policy, uh, because there is no funding for an office or other things. But the consequence of that office being disbanded was that I got booted out to uh, the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. Um, that is essentially a court, uh, and there's an $861 application fee just to get in the door. So uh, I, despite being a lawyer, don't have a lot of money uh, and didn't really want to throw $900 at uh, pursuing this application, so I went... Uh, for crowdfunding, and I launched a campaign on Possible. Um, and that was initially just for the purpose of uh, that $800-odd application fee. I launched that 11.40 one morning. Uh, by 1.20 p.m., that's an hour and 40 minutes, uh, I was fully funded for that application fee. Um, so... Oh. Thank you. And look, uh, I mean, what I ended up uh, with was 213 supporters giving between two and $2,000 uh, to this cause. I was really amazed that uh, other people were as interested in this as I was, uh, but it has been really fantastic to see that level of support, uh, and I was really humbled by that. Uh, so that additional money, we ended up with nearly $10,500, a fair bit of it in Bitcoin, and that was at the height of the Bitcoin bubble, so it's now worth a little bit less. Um, but that goes not just to uh, that application fee, there are costs in terms of transcripts, expert witnesses, uh, access charges if we end up actually getting access, uh, and legal fees. Uh, despite being a lawyer myself, it's not an area of uh, specialisation for me, so I actually engaged uh, another lawyer to assist in the process as well. Um, so here I was going off to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal with the hope that... Uh, the court would be able to see the light and understand why it was that I thought that this material should be public domain, why there is clearly no commercial benefit uh, or, or, or no commercial value that's lost by uh, releasing the information. Meanwhile, I go back to the Electoral Commission uh, and I say I'd like the list of documents, the list of files, please, so that I can make my argument. Uh, I put in that application under the Freedom of Information Act so that was the, uh, the uh, 
second application I'd made under the Freedom of Information Act. It was the third application, if you count Matt Landauer's request for the word copy of the document. Um, they said that I was being difficult and vexatious. Um, and I said, well, if you want to try to have me declared vexatious, go right ahead. Uh, so they did. Um, and they wrote to the Information Commissioner and tried to have me declared a vexatious applicant. Um, does anyone know what this picture is? Yes. That's right, it's Barbara Streisand's house. <laughs> Uh, in making that application to have me declared vexatious, I suddenly got quite a bit of media attention. A lot of people were suddenly on my side because of how uh, absurd that was, and I ended up raising quite a bit more money. Um, so that look ended up being quite good for me, uh, and ultimately the Electoral Commission uh, did not think it was ac accurate to describe uh, Matt's uh, request as being collusion with me, uh, did not place any weight on the AEC's contentions and uh, was unwilling to declare me a vexatious applicant, uh, which was really good for me because being vexatious is not something you want in a lawyer uh, normally. <laughs> uh, but that did take some time. So that was uh, October of 2014 before that decision came down, by which stage the AAT application was already uh, rolling along, the crowdfunding was long past. Uh, we also had, around that time, quite a bit of political interest. Um, there was a motion before the Senate that said that by the 15th of July 2014, the source code of the software used to count votes should be placed before the House, so that is made a public record. Uh, the Special Minister for State refused to produce that document to the Senate on the basis, in part, that publication could leave the voting system open to hacking or manipulation. Um, which is a terrifying thought, if true. Uh, <laughs> well, exactly, right? Are they going to write drop tables on the ballot paper? Uh, well, no, and this is, this is the point, is that it's a, a wholly disconnected system. It's not networked at all. And in fact, the data that moves around the system moves on USB sticks for exactly this reason. Uh, the, the system is not open to any sort of manipulation in that way, or if it is, the only people who could manipulate it would be the Electoral Commission. So that kind of excuse, uh, again, was uh, really surprising to me, but ultimately uh, the, uh, the, that was the response that was given to the Senate, and there's no real further action that can be taken short of you know, a vote of no confidence, which I don't think the Senate was particularly uh, willing to... Uh, to push on this issue. Uh, so where we ended up, uh, I presented a talk at LCA uh, at the beginning of this year, uh, and uh, while I was there, I met um, Dr. Andrew Tridgell, uh, and he uh, came on board as an expert witness talking about uh, uh, all of the things that are uh, about software development that are really important in this uh, in this case. So the argument ended up being about two things. Uh, firstly, what constitutes a document? It turns out that uh, the Electoral Commission want to say that the entirety of the system they use, which is called EasyCount, is a single document. Um, that's about uh, 3,500 distinct files. Uh, it's about 270,000 lines of code or 270,000 lines, whether that's lines of code or lines, it's not clear. Um, but I mean, that's an enormous uh, thing to consider a single document. Uh, it's written, we've discovered, in the version of Visual Basic, which is csharp.net. Um, uh, so it, it's written in C-sharp, it, uh, and it, it's this you know, relatively complex, relatively substantial software project. Uh, my assumption would be that each file, or at least each class, or you know, there's, there's some logical distinction that you could say these are individual documents. These are separate things that we can look at. Uh, the uh, Electoral Commission argued against that and argued that it was an all or nothing proposition. Either I was to have access to the entirety of the source code, uh, or I was only permitted, or, or I was not permitted to have access to any of it. That it was not uh, appropriate to treat each individual element as a separate document and therefore make separate decisions about each of those elements. Um, 
that turns out to be uh, important in some ways and in some of the arguments that we ended up having in court, uh, which were mostly about uh, whether the software, the, the source code could be used as a roadmap to develop uh, new similar software without making a direct copy of it. So if the source code's released, it's still subject to copyright law, it's still completely protected, uh, and that means that the Electoral Commission could sue anyone who was going to you know, take it as a whole uh, or take any substantial part of it and turn that into their own software. So uh, that, to me, said there's, nothing, there's no commercial value that's lost, because even to the extent that some competitor is going to take this software and start running it themselves, that's copyright infringement, and the AEC will have a remedy. Uh, the argument ended up being from the commission that uh, the software was, that the design, the layout of the software, the fact that the methods interacted in particular ways, uh, those things were of sufficient ingenuity that uh, it would be, and I see some raised eyebrows here, uh, <laughs> that, that they had commercial value in and of themselves. So even though the particular implementation wouldn't be taken or couldn't be taken, it was the uh, way that the various classes interacted or being able to see the way that people had done things that would give competitors a head start that would result in a real commercial disadvantage to the Electoral Commission. Um, that's not an argument I buy, uh, or many other people seem to buy outside the Electoral Commission, but that's the argument that we ended up talking about. So uh, that's why it's important for the Commission for the whole thing to be a single document, because if we're looking at each individual element separately, then the interaction between classes and the interaction between files isn't going to be uh, protect isn't going to be something that we can consider. So uh, those ended up being the arguments. Uh, we appeared at the end of July this year, so we're already talking nearly two years by the time we get to court, um, before Deputy President Mellick and Member Taglieri of the uh, Administrative Appeals Tribunal here in Tasmania, in Hobart. Uh, this is from the very beginning of the, uh, of the case. So the presiding member, Deputy President Malik, started by saying, I should note from the outset I have a limited understanding of computer software. Well, I mean, we probably expected that, and that's okay, uh, but the next part starts to get a little bit more difficult. He said, it's very difficult to protect, and remember, this is before any argument has taken place. He said, it's very difficult to protect computer software from being used as a roadmap to develop other software. And from my experience, that's almost impossible to deal with once a source code has been divulged, and the A was in there as much as it irritates me. Um, so we started this case with the person making the decision essentially being offside, essentially saying he didn't understand the issues, or, or he didn't understand computer software, I shouldn't say he didn't understand the issues, um, and that in his experience, in his knowledge, uh, it's very difficult to provide any adequate protection for software once source code has been revealed. So. Uh, that was kind of a tough uh, thing to hear at the very beginning of the case uh, before we'd been able to present any argument or, or any witnesses. Uh, these are some quotes from uh, the witness that came from the Electoral Commission who's in charge of development. Uh, so firstly, the architecture of EasyCount is not well suited to unit testing. Um, if you can think of anything better suited to unit testing <laughs> than <laughs> object-oriented vote counting software, please let me know, because I can't. Um, so, I mean, this was as part of a line of questioning where we were trying to establish that independent parts could operate independently, and we didn't need to see the whole of the software. Again, it's that argument about what constitutes a document. Um, he also said that none of the features may be considered particularly complex or innovative, and that's really not surprising. Um, it's not just the vote counting software. One of the things they touted as being uh, an important feature that differentiated EasyCount from other solutions was that when you do data entry, it knows how many numbers to expect in each box and automatically advances you to the next text box. So as sophisticated and innovative as that feature is, uh, I think it's fair to say that none of those features are particularly complex or innovative. But he said the software itself is very sophisticated in that it could handle multiple types of elections. 
And it's true to say that it's a big software project, you know? It's, um, it's not an enormous software project, but it's big enough. 270,000 lines, 3,500 uh, files. Like, that's got a decent size to it. Uh, it does relatively complex things. It uses object orientation uh, to, for example, inherit the Senate count class from a proportional representation class from a general vote counting class. I mean, that's exactly as you would expect and relatively straightforward, but it means that the software can be used to count votes in lots of different types of electoral systems. So if you have the NRMA election, for example, and they don't use a Senate counting methodology, but they use Hare-Clark or some other uh, electoral system, then this software can be used for that. So that's good. I mean, I, it's, I'm glad that uh, they have that capability. But again, uh, that complexity doesn't mean that there's anything of particular commercial value in that. And that was the argument that uh, we were trying to run as much as possible. Uh, it was really good, therefore, when Dr. Tridgell got up uh, and said, firstly, the structure is not magic in a piece of software, that these decisions about uh, what, how to structure your software, how the different parts will interact, are really decisions that can be made by any software engineer at the time they develop the software. He said, and this is my favourite quote, to a competent software engineer, this is mundane stuff. Uh, and that was really powerful, and by the end of the case, uh, the presiding member uh, was commenting on how great uh, Dr. Tridgell's evidence was, uh, how clearly unbiased it was, how willing he was to make concessions, uh, and I, I, that really points to the quality of his evidence. Uh, and he was able to demonstrate that not just in his field of expertise, but in software generally, uh, he compared the decisions being made about how to structure a piece of software uh, to decisions made about how to lay out paragraphs uh, in an essay. You know, there are lots of different right answers to that, and it's not particularly exciting to see someone else's if you can't just copy it holus bolus. Um, and that final quote there, I wouldn't bother my time reading through 270,000 lines of mundane code. I'd be better off spending that time writing a test suite for my own software and starting the validation process. Because the key element to electoral software is that it works. And the way to make sure that it works is to test it, using, for example, unit testing. Um, and that was one of the points that he kept making, was that the hard part was in going through that testing process. The hard part was not writing the software that performs the count, it's writing the, the tests for that software that make sure it performs the count properly, that makes sure it deals with edge cases, that makes sure that it precisely implements those rules, that it does things like, you know, uh, fixed point arithmetic rather than IEEE or uh, truncating at the wrong place or, or whatever it is. Um, so uh, that point ended up being made very strongly throughout the case. Uh, by the end of it, and I'm just not sure, yeah. Uh, by the end of the case, uh, we, had, uh, we had effectively lost the argument, I think, about whether it's a single document or a whole series of documents. Uh, that's in part because we didn't have access to the material, obviously, so we weren't able to make arguments about why it could cogently be considered uh, a series of separate documents. It was also in part because the tribunal didn't want to have to make 3,700 separate decisions, one for each file, which is probably fair as well. Um, so uh, that, that actually uh, causes this to be an all or nothing outcome. So we either get the entirety of the software that was being used or we get nothing. Um, are we going to win? Well, uh, the case was heard at the end of July. We had a little bit of time for supplementary submissions. Uh, and we've now been, I think, 11 weeks since those submissions were filed. So they're taking their time to make a decision. Uh, and I think that that's a good thing, given the starting point that we had, which was, I'm going to lose this. Uh, I'm still not sure that uh, the evidence or that the argument will be sufficient to demonstrate that there's no commercial loss to the AEC. All they need to show is that they would lose a dollar because some competitor would gain some advantage from the material that is being made public here. It doesn't matter that there's a real public interest in seeing the source code behind our election voting systems. 
it doesn't matter that they've spent $900,000 developing it and less, they've received about $300,000 in revenue from those licensing activities. It doesn't matter, uh, like th those elements of the case are actually totally unimportant to the decision. The only thing that will have an impact on whether this information can be released under freedom of information is whether or not the AEC will suffer or can be expected to suffer some commercial loss as a consequence. And all they need to do, as I say, is to demonstrate that some programmer somewhere working for a competitor will pull up the source code and get something from it that will reduce development time. Or that some programmer will say, you know what, it's actually a good idea to copy and paste this whole uh, class, and I'm going to keep using that class, despite the fact that it doesn't fit in with the rest of what I'm doing, uh, and despite the fact that who uses C stuff? Anyway. Um, <laughs> So, you know, that some developer is going to do that, and yes, it's copyright infringement, but the AEC will never know. So that's all it's going to take for the AEC to win this case. Uh, and that uh, paints a slightly pessimistic outcome, uh, a slightly pessimistic view, because uh, this, it, it takes so little for them to win. Uh, there are a couple of good things, though. Uh, we now know it's written in .NET. Um, we, I, I think that there are good arguments that could be made for access to particular parts of the software. In particular, those uh, classes or those elements of the software which are used solely for the Senate count, because those don't have any commercial use. Uh, I think that there's a really good political motivation here uh, to get a policy decision that this stuff should be open sourced. Uh, and that's not just because of the political interest. Uh, it's because the, the commercial reality is that they're not making a whole bunch of money out of the software. Uh, that $350,000 that I mentioned, uh, that's not just funds from licensing the software. That, in, that includes the total revenue they make from running elections which use the software. So you can imagine there are a whole bunch of input costs there, things like staffing, printing of ballot papers, advertising, actually operating the thing. And all of those costs come out. So the commerciality of the software, I think, is subject to real question at a policy level. It's also really interesting that in uh, 2009, I believe it was, uh, the Electoral Commission said to a Senate inquiry that we're happy to show this software to any political party that's interested and there's no risk of hacking because it's all disconnected. In total contradiction to what they've been saying recently. Unfortunately, I couldn't use that as evidence because of parliamentary privilege. <laughs> so although that would have been really helpful to establish that they were willing to share the software with their competitors or with others, uh, unfortunately, uh, that simply wasn't available because of, of the nuance of the court process. So uh, at the end of this, uh, I've ended up spending you know, the $10,000 odd that uh, we got. Uh, and it's not all been spent yet, but it, it will be. Uh, so it's cost a lot of money. It's probably cost the Electoral Commission three or four times that, um, which uh, you know, goes again to that commerciality question. Uh, and I was really glad that I had, was able to hold the hearing here in Hobart, and all their uh, you know, fancy lawyers flew in from around the country to argue with little old me. Um, so. Uh, you know, there's, there's been a lot of uh, money. There's been a huge amount of time. We're now more than two years since I put in that initial request. Uh, and I'm hope I was hopeful of a decision before today, but it, we have no idea when that decision will come down. Uh, it could be tomorrow. It could be next week. It could be next year. I really hope it doesn't take that long. Uh, but, you know, it's an extremely lengthy process. Uh, all of which is going to come to an outcome where, at best, uh, we win in the Administrative Appeals Tribunal. I suspect that that would result in an appeal to the federal court uh, and the inordinate cost that's associated with that. Uh, I do have some pro bono legal assistance that's been offered if it does get to that stage. But uh, you know, again, that's an enormous uh, amount of time, amount of energy, amount of cost that will be associated with that. But let's say that the appeal doesn't happen or we win. 
The end result is still that we get to read the software, but we can't use it. It's still not open source, uh, or at least not in the sense that we understand it in this room. Uh, it's not software that you can take, uh, you can make copies of, or you can modify and redistribute, despite the fact that the government has spent you know, a million odd dollars developing it, despite the fact that it's used for uh, a really public purpose, uh, and it's, it's probably one of the most important things to be able to access, the, despite the fact that the scrutiny process uh, that exists is so prescriptive about the way that people deal with paper ballots, but we have no right uh, under the legislation to see how the computer operates. And those are the things that are really most interesting to me, is the way that uh, the law isn't designed to deal with uh, these issues. The law is outdated with its reference to documents, which can include things like maps and plans, but we're not really clear about what that means in a computing context. It's not clear whether that means individual bits or whether it means files or whether it means rows in a database or you know the database itself. So... It, it's really brought to my attention the total disconnect we have between uh, the way that the law operates and, and the way that we can use the law to try to force these outcomes uh, and the way that the technology operates and the way that we understand the technology. Uh, the reason that freedom of information law came about, uh, it was an American invention uh, and it came about because we, uh, because it's important for government to be transparent, which is uh, one part of it, but also because the products of government labour should be free for use by all of the people in the country. Right? That, that uh, product is produced using taxpayer funds. It's produced for a public purpose. Therefore, it should be available to the public as a whole. And that's the basis behind a lot of, thank you, that's the basis behind a lot of the open government stuff that we've been talking about. It's the basis behind data.gov.au and the release of information under Creative Commons licenses. But we're still seeing pockets where it is virtually impossible to use a crowbar to force the government to release information that really should be released. The final thing uh, I want to say is just a huge thanks to all of the people who supported uh, me in this project. Uh, it's a very small text because there's a very lo long list of people uh, who provided money, or time, expertise, uh, who have been incredibly generous uh, in supporting this endeavour. Uh, I think it's really important that this has not just been my personal crusade, that it's actually been uh, the effort of kind of an ad hoc community to try to convince the government to change its mind, to try to force uh, the release of source code. I think that there's probably more productive ways uh, to go about this in future, and that's really a policy-driven approach rather than a legalistic approach. Uh, but being a lawyer, when all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, <laughs> But I think it has been a really productive exercise in exposing those weaknesses in the current system and exposing uh, how easy count and how this particular system, uh, the, uh, the obstinance of the Electoral Commission uh, in refusing to release this information is just so unreasonable but so entirely within the law. Uh, and I'm happy to take any questions if there are some. Thank you, Michael. You're doing great work. This is, and that was an excellent talk. Um, do we have any questions? Uh, you look like you were first. Uh, thank you, Michael. Um, my question is sort of along the lines of the appeal of what could happen next if it doesn't go well. Um, so, and one of the points I heard you made there was the opening remarks by the presiding judge in this AAT case. So, are those sort of some good arguments that could be used if it had to go to another level? Uh, yeah, look, those I think could be very persuasive. Uh, certain, and I mean, it's all about the judgment that gets finally issued, but if it goes against us, I think there, there would be grounds for a federal court appeal. The problem is, again, cost. Uh, to initiate a federal court appeal, you're talking about nearly $2,000. Uh, that's before any of the legal costs. It's before dealing with expert costs, transcripts, you know, hearing days, 
there are, uh, I, I, I would be potentially keen, uh, depending obviously on what the judgment actually says, to push this further if it, if it came to that. Um, I do think that there are real issues in the approach that was taken by the presiding member as indicated by those opening remarks, um, which might be good grounds for an appeal. Uh, but I am not confident that the money is there or that it would be the best way to spend twenty or $30,000 uh, to run an appeal when that money could go to the Refugee Legal Service, for example, but also, uh, you know, lobbying or, or other open source activities. Is, is there an alternative um, to the idea that, <clears throat> and as, as you said, if the purpose is simply to get another pair of eyeballs to look at the code and say, yep, that's code, um, and but you can't open it and you can't do anything else with it. Is it is one of those alternative avenues then to say to to pursue, say, a, a, a level of provability or you know, prov you know passing unit tests or things like that? Yeah, and there uh, the electoral commission has done some work. They've engaged an independent testing consultant to demonstrate that the system operated in accordance with the Act. Uh, part of that report is publicly available, part of it is not, uh, we're showing. Um, the other thing that there is, is all of the data is available. Uh, the Electoral Commission has recently started releasing, uh, I mean, they've always released to the media, uh, all of the below the line votes and all of the, the vote data. Uh, they've recently started releasing it to the public in general. So you can actually go grab all these zipped up CSVs, uh, process it, see if the outcome is the same. Um, the only, uh, there are only two people I know who've done that. One is Anthony Green, the ABC electoral analyst. Um, <laughs> his software does that. Uh, and the other is Graham Boland, who's the West Australian I mentioned before. Um, after the WA Senate election issues, he went and wrote some software to do that with the primary purpose, I think, of uh, modelling potential different outcomes, the whole 14 votes thing. Um, so, look, that is doable, uh, but... Uh, and, and does demonstrate the correctness of outcome in a particular instance. It doesn't necessarily demonstrate uh, that the whole chain is effective or consistent or that there's not some, uh, I mean, I don't think there's any malicious interference with the code. I, I think that the Electoral Commission does a really good job of being independent. But if there was any malicious interference, it wouldn't show up in that verification process because the steps between seeing the piece of paper with all the votes written down and it being published on the AEC's website includes this easy count system, which is wholly closed source. Um, thank you again, Michael, for um, an excellent talk and for excellent answers to everybody's questions. Um, another round of applause, please, for... <laughs> and uh, here's a gift for... Uh, thanks, Michael. We now have...